Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this uh, conference. And I have been avoiding to go into lectures about cons consciousness really during my whole life. But the last week I started looking into Christoph uh, Koff and Francis Crick book. And what you're going to see today is the result of a lot of sleepless and thinking and confusion after reading the book. But I think that they did a great job. And I think that probably I was just afraid because the complexity of the problem to treat that. And as a physiologist, I just like problems that I can attack and I can't, you know, precisely. So if you listen to me speaking in Spanish, is that I lost it, so tell me, please. Uh, gracias. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about voluntary attention and working memory in primates. And I'm primarily a physiologist. And the reason why I went into physiology was because when I, I studied medicine, I started seeing patients, and I was so... Uh, disappointed by the little that we know about them, and I started studying, studying attention because uh, it was really a very strong motivating thing for me. Um, and one of the things that I got clear from the book was this. Consciousness then is enriched by visual attention, though attention is not essential for visual consciousness to occur. Very disappointing for me. Although working memory expands the time frame of consciousness, it is not obvious that it is essential for consciousness. So that's two things that I got clear from the book. So neither of the two things that I'm going to talk about today seems to be essential for consciousness. But hopefully, in the data that I'm going to present, I'm trying to relate the things to uh, what I learned from the book and from many other lectures that, that I, and papers that I wrote, uh, we're going to learn something about it. So I won't define consciousness. I think that I'm going to refer here, and there are probably many types of consciousness, to conscious perception or conscious visual perception. So the ability to report those things that we see, uh, that's what I'm going to refer here. Um, but more than that, and I like it, these NCCs because those are the neural correlates of consciousness, and that's what I do. I record the electrical activity of neurons, and I try to figure out how the brain works by doing that kind of thing. And the neural correlation of consciousness, that's not my definition, that's their definition, Christopher Koch and, and, and Craig definition. It's a minimal set of neural events and magnets jointly sufficient for a specific conscious percept involves the firing activity of neurons in the forebrain. The, the forebrain is involved a lot of structures. I mean, if you know a little bit of embryology, they must be an explicit correspondence between any mental events and if neuronal correlates. This is an important thing, and we, uh, I'm going to refer that to uh, later on. So what, what can the study of attention and working memory teach us about the NCCs? Uh, first of all, I want to define attention. And I had these conversations with Paul Sisek that I asked about here that we were calling uh, different names to the same thing. We're talking about uh, decision-making, attention, and things like that. Well, I'm going to work with the definition of attention because if not, I have no job. So attention, I believe that is an evolutionary thing that happens to humans and uh, probably humans and other species, the main thing that we do is we receive sensory signals and we generate some kind of behavior. And I like to think that many of the things that we study in cognition, including consciousness, uh, has a role in how do we transform the world. So if consciousness is something that we can define, it's probably something that is useful for us to generate some kind of output and to be more successful in any of the functions that we do. That's the way. So does attention. Um, attention, I believe, that arises as a problem of limited information processing capacity. So if you, are, if you read across these lines uh, in primates, the eye can receive the raw information from the visual scene, but the optical nerve transmits only 2% of the information captured by the retina. So we're really pathetic in terms of information processing when it comes to visual information. But importantly, even that 60% 60, 60 of the primary neocortex is devoted to vision, the visual cortex processes only 1% of the information transmitted by the optical nerve. So there is a huge amount of reduction uh, in the amount of, inf a, a huge reduction in the amount of information that we receive. Uh, how the brain deals with this problem. So I, the way that I like to see the problem is there are two ways to do that. One is the, is the hardware way. So, which is like system of hardwired filters. For example, the, the retina in the fovea, you have a huge, uh, a, a large concentration of photoreceptors with high resolution. It's like you have a high resolution TV in the fovea, and in the periphery, you have pretty bad resolution. So, uh, this is a kind of hardwired hard wire or hardware filter. And you also have that the representation of the fovea in the visual cortex is pretty large. 
So most of the V1, you would be disappointed if you try to find resective fields in the periphery more than five degrees apart if you're recording single units in a monkey. That's the cortex of the monkey, and that's the occipital cortex. And what you see here is probably around five degrees from the fovea. So, um, and there is also another example that I love it of this homunculus. I mean, you're pretty good, and the representation of the lips and the hands and things like that is pretty large in the somatosensory cortex. But the representation of non-informative part, like your back, I mean, what do you want your back for? That's not, I mean, you want it, of course, because you need to see it and things like that, but it's not very, very useful to sense things. So uh, I, this is what I call hardwire filter. But attention, I would like to think as a software filter. So in evolution, that was probably not enough. You still need something that you need to switch on and off uh, uh, quickly. And the way that you do it is probably by selecting and modulating sensory inputs that comes into the brain by this selection and modulation, I can change it. For example, if I want to, if I'm looking for a person wearing this red shirt, red shirt in this scene, I, my brain can do something like that, concentrate it in the red, and just highlight the spots of red, and then my eye movements are gonna go directly to where those things are. Um, whether I'm consciously perceive, perceiving them or not, I'm not sure, but the eye movements, the behavior is going to go right where those spots are, or more. And I can do the same with blue. And I can do the same with yellow. So I can do that very flexibly. That's what attention does pretty much. It allows you this flexibility that, of course, the hardware filters won't allow you to do. So now, how do we study attention? We study attention in macaques. So here we have the macaque one, two, three. I like to think that it is like the third, I mean, this old world primates with this convoluted cortex. And then we have the apes, and we don't do experiments on them for ethical reasons. And then we have the humans. So the closer that we can get to the humans uh, doing electrophysiological experiments is the macaque monkey. And that's exactly uh, the model that I use. Of course, there are other models. Uh, um, but um, you will see what we use in macaques. So if you look at the brain areas, you have the, almost the same areas in the macaque and, and, the, and, the, and the human. Also, the human has suffered an expansion of the, what we call the prefrontal cortex. That is almost three times the one of the macaque, and if you're talking about a rat or an animal like that, it's almost 10 times that of the macaque. So some of the experiments that I'm gonna to show today are in the prefrontal cortex. So uh, we also know the visual pathways in the macaque monkey. Probably someone has talked about what we call the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway. So some people like to see these dorsal pathways in some of the literature, like some kind of zombie pathways, because it produces all these uh, kind of things that you don't realize, but you that you're not conscious of, but your actions reflect your knowledge of the things, like vision for action and vision for perception. So this pathway is more involved in this vision for action. And this one is more involved in vision for perception, but the truth is that when you look at the cell's properties in these uh, areas, you, they also differ in the kind of things that they encode. Some of them encode motion direction or visual disparity, and others encode color, uh, 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 orientation like in this uh, pathway. So um, there is a lot of connections back and forth in these areas, and there is like short range connections, if you want to call it, and there is like long range connections. There is a lot of areas missing, but this uh, is a little bit less complicated than what uh, Wolf Singer showed, but uh, believe me, it could get very complicated. And it could get even more complicated than that. So it's not easy to study this, putting a single electrode in an area and trying to record single neurons, or even several electrodes in several areas and trying to record single neurons. Um, now, why don't we use the monkey? Because the monkey is also, this, these are very, uh, you can train them in a pretty uh, uh, reasonable amount of time to do tasks that humans would do. So this is a pretty, um, um, so it's a pretty good model. Also, we can lower an electrode when the animal is uh, um, uh, uh, behaving or, or doing a task in front of the computer monitor and get close to a neuron. And when we get close to a neuron, we can listen to the uh, uh, action potentials, actually, that the electrode that, that the neuron is producing. This is a hair. This is a courtesy of a Stefan Troy that was made by the German uh, uh, graphic artist that I think that is uh, already retired, but he does all of this by hand. It's amazing. So, um, but this is a hair, and this is the electrode that we use to listen to single neurons. And the way that we do that is that we listen to them like this. So we put it in a display, and what you see is the action potentials of two different neurons recorded from a single electrode. Then we count them, like many physiologists, that we spend our life counting action potentials over a certain time interval defined by psychophysics or by different things. 
and then we get what we call the firing rate. And this is my first uh, uh, link to consciousness. If you show inside the receptive field of a neuron in area MT, middle temporal, the same one that uh, Eric Cook uh, was talking about, um, and you instruct the animal to fixate here, and you, inside the receptive field you show a moving stimulus. It could be a moving dot, could be a random dot pattern in different directions, let's say right, left, different directions. And then you plot the firing rate of the neuron in a spikes per second as a function of the direction of the stimulus, you will see that the firing rate of the neuron follows this curve. So, and this is a Gaussian function. So basically, there are neurons in area MT that when the animal is perceiving a uh, 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 motion up, they're responding very high, and when the animal is perceiving motion down, very low, and there is others that they do vice versa. So we can say that there must be an explicit correspondence between mental events and neural correlates. Well, perhaps MT does match that criteria in, in terms of neural correlates of consciousness. Uh, now, there is also empty neurons signal the presence of a given motion direction when monkeys consciously perceive that motion direction, so that's what I show. And it's also uh, Newson's group have shown that if you activate empty neurons by electrical microsimulation, the monkey responds as if the monkey is perceiving right, that motion direction. That's what, what you do. Uh, in the, the monkey, you cannot ask the monkey, what did you see? I mean, that doesn't work for monkeys. You have to just document certain kind of behavior and see how that uh, uh, comes out. Uh, whether the animal perceive it or not, I mean, those are clues that you need to get. I mean, with a human, you have language. But um, there are other problems with humans. But with the monkey, we have that specific problem. But at least the behavior signals that. Now, the first question that we asked was, what does attention do to uh, the tuning curve of neurons? So we call, well, it looks like a, like a, like a NCC. And, uh, that was during my PhD. And what I did was to look at the responses of these neurons. And what I saw was that attention increases the firing rate of a stimulus. So the tuning curve is when the stimulus is ignored. So the, suppose that this is not relevant for the animal. Now, when the stimulus acquire relevance for the animal, so you see that attention increases the firing rate of the neuron to all kinds of stimuli. So uh, the detector is getting better. So um, uh, we did some measurements of some of the properties of the tuning curve, and we found that it was mostly like a multiplicative change in response. Now, there is a second property of visual neurons that has to do with the visibility of the stimulus. If I turn the light off here, probably you won't see me until you adapt. And if I turn completely the light, you won't see me. So you need certain kind of contrast, or you need certain kind of photons on your retina uh, with a certain distribution to see things. That property is called, in visual neurons, is called contrast. It is important that contrast is a relative luminance between two surfaces. It's not the absolute value of luminance. And that's what these neurons are sensitive to. And if you look at the neuron and you have like a stimulus, for example, of the neuron lights, and you start increasing the contrast of the stimulus, what you see is a sigmoid curve. So at some point, the neurons start, yeah, high, 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 and then it plateaus here. So there is a plateau. There is a reason why the neuron doesn't fire. It's not a linear function. And we call that contrast response function. It has to do with the properties of the circuitry. But the, the, the main point here is that we study how attention changes the contrast response function. Um, and basically, what attention does is shift the contrast response function through this axis. When you attend to the stimulus, this is a little bit confusing because the experiment was confusing. When you attend to the stimulus, uh, or was complex, not confusing, uh, this, this contrast response function goes to the left. And when you ignore the stimulus, it goes to the right. So if the contrast response function goes to the left, this is the response of the neuron. It means that with less contrast, you're achieving a response of the neuron. So you're encoding better the stimulus. So in this case, uh, what I would say is attending to a stimulus is equivalent to increasing, increasing its contrast or visibility. And we're conscious of things that we can see, right? So attention is not just a filter. Attention also uh, to solve competition between a stimuli. And attention also influences conscious visual perception. And when I went to, let me make a connection to, uh, to Christoph Koch's book, I think that uh, I remember that he said that attention is not needed when you have a single stimuli. I believe that in this case, attention is, acts like an amplifier. 
so it increases the contrast of the stimulus. So it does influence conscious perception. So from that point of view, I don't quite agree with, with that view that attention is not needed if you don't have a lot of a stimuli. It's more needed if you have a lot of a stimuli because you have to filter. But if you have one a stimulus, attention is also needed. In this case, acting like boosting the response of the neuron. So uh, we came up with a model that also, um, and we'll make a connection here at some point to the book. Uh, uh, so that how this modulation with attention happens. And one of the uh, uh, hypotheses that we had is that the modulation in area MT happens through modulation of, of responses of single neurons in area V1. Area V1, the resective fields are quite small. In area MT, it's almost 10 times the resective field of an area V1. So what we thought that attention could do is switch on and off. I mean, that is, uh, um, um, I seem, I'm making it simple. But influence, increase the gain, for example, of the attended stimulus and decrease the gain of the ignored stimulus. And then what you do is obtain almost like a resective field change in area MT. Like, uh, 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 and when you start going up in the hierarchy of processing, you could get almost to eliminate these two stimuli. When you get to the frontal cortex, and I'm going to show you later, you practically, the neurons in the frontal cortex don't see the stimulus. When I say a neuron doesn't see, it's kind of uh, uh, weird to say that, because all what the neuron does is integrate from other neurons that connect to the neuron. The neuron doesn't see things in the world. The neuron doesn't perceive things in the world. The neuron integrates and fire. That's what it does with different transfer functions depending where you are. So in this experiment, what we did is we tried to put three stimuli inside the resective field of an empty neuron, and then we instruct the animals to attend to this one or to these two. And this is the experiment. The monkey is uh, here fixating a dot here, and then we have three stimuli, one inside the resective field of a neuron that produces a strong response. And then we have two translating stimuli that they are going to pass across the resective field when they translate. And the theory is that we are going to find a strong modulation uh, when the animal attend to this stimulus, the response is going to be high when the animal attend to these two stimuli that, by the way, could be bad stimuli for the cell, the response is going to be low because we, the animal is going to be filtered around the influence of these stimuli. This is the different configurations that we use. Um, basically, this is exactly what we found. What you see in green is the response when the animal is attending to this stimulus, and when you see in red is the response when the animal is attending to these two stimuli and ignoring the one in between. So it's like the resective field has been split into two. And if you keep going up in the hierarchy, we didn't document that. I mean, we're going to, I don't know what is going to happen. My guess is that these stimuli are going to be lost. Now, the question is, does the animal see the stimuli? Does the, uh, does the animal, uh, do the animal perceive the stimuli still, even if some neurons in the brain don't see it? And, um, Okay, well, this is the, these are the conclusions. This is the modulation of V1 neurons. And this is a model that we propose where there is a bunch of V1 cells, then attention acts in here, and you have like almost like a split of resective fields. But there is a problem here. NCCs are not found in area V1 because V1 sees everything. Even if the animal doesn't see anything, animal, this is one of the things that I got clear from the book. I don't quite... I, I still don't quite understand it very well because there is this past fit forward of information and there is also this fit bad of information that people relate to consciousness when the whole thing engaged in a loop information. Uh, I wasn't sure if he was talking, if they're talking about the fit forward path of everything, but if he's talking about everything, probably V1 is also needed for this feedback mechanism and things like that. So um, this is a red flag. I'm not sure what to think about it. I'm confused. So attention may at an early stage of visual processing where neurons do not signal the conscious per se by the sensory stimulus. It is possible that attention acts really very early when, when neurons don't just uh, uh, are encoding the sensory stimulus, and these effects accumulate up, 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 and when you get to other places in the brain where perhaps perception lights up or some kind of threshold or conscious perception, uh, then you have uh, um, an effect that is big. But that kind of dissociates attention and uh, conscious perception. Okay? So 
There is a couple of things that I will summarize here. Studies of anesthetized animals show activation of area V1 without conscious perception. However, how can we ask the monkey whether it perceives something during the anesthesia? There is no way to do that, right? And, so, and also, if you ask the monkey after the anesthesia in monkey language, probably there is also no way that saying that the monkeys perceive it, but it just didn't go into memory, into long-term memory or into working memory. So it's a very complicated problem. We cannot ask monkey, the monkey because we don't speak monkey language. Perhaps the best evidence that we have in favor of this claim is that coming from a study of visual rivalry and a study of illusion, that V1 neurons are probably the least from V1, V2, V4 to, uh, to oscillate with, with the rivalry percepts. I mean, there are several studies in, in uh, sorry, there is a third point here. There is all evidence from motion group, and probably Chris is going to talk about them today, that the more you go into the hierarchy of processing uh, in both pathways, the neuron seems to be reflecting what the perception is, at least the perception that we do in psychophysics, and then we look at the animal, and then we look at the behavior of the animal and see the perception, it's going to be much more uh, connected to the animal perceived as you advance. Now, here I would ask another interesting question that I didn't think about it until a week ago. So is it possible that the effects of attention in some brain areas produce a complete filtering of a stimuli that are still consciously, consciously perceived? So it is possible that attention goes too far and say, okay, those neurons don't see the stimulus, but the monkey still perceives the stimulus. That could also give us a clue about the consciousness or about the NCCs. So we went to an area of the frontal cortex that is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and all this area seems to project back to the back part of the brain. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is an area that has been studied by Joaquin Fuster and Goldman Rackett, and lately by some people's on attention. I have been involved in many things, and, and, and there is many papers on that. So those are some of the papers that relate that to attention. And what we looked was how neurons filter stimuli or change the firing rate with attention in the frontal cortex. Our hypothesis was that the source of attentional feedback is coming from here, not from FEF, not from LIP, uh, at least for certain tasks like feature-based attention tasks, because uh, FEF neurons in particular are really bad at encoding the feature of a stimulus, you know, firing low, if it is red, white, the so neurons in FEF are really bad, so we went to this area to find that. And we trained the monkey in a very interesting and fun task. The monkey was fixating a dot, and here we presented two random dot patterns that were moving up, they were white. At some point, the random dot patterns changed color, and the monkey has to choose one of them, and attend to one of them, ignore the other, and then the monkey has to uh, release a lever when, some, when a change in the direction of that attended pattern happens, and the monkey gets some reward, some drops of rum or tequila or juice. <laughs> so it depends what the monkey likes. Now, the fun thing with this task is that in this task, we have several uh, um, uh, colors, and we organize the color in a completely arbitrary way. So that was blue. I mean, there is nothing that tells me that red is more than green. In fact, ecologically, that probably shouldn't be. Well, red is blood, but then we have here blue that is white, well, it's a sky, so it has no sense. And this is stimuli. That if you look at this ordinal uh, this, uh, scale, which is totally artificial, we have different distance between the different colors, one, two, and three. And there is an effect that is in the literature, many of you, which is like, uh, we, they call the distance effect. If I tell you which number is greater, one or 10, you send me 10, uh, which number is greater, four or five, it takes a little, a little bit longer. So because it's hard to, to solve that, that uh, thing. So we use that as a way to modify the monkey's reaction time, and we succeeded. So but, well, this is the task for the monkey. So the monkey goes over many, many sessions, and they learn by trial and error, using operant conditioning, which one is which. So and what they do is uh, uh, we record it when the monkeys were already trained, and the monkeys did pretty well in the task. We're recording the responses of neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I'm going to summarize uh, in this slide what happened. So basically, the, the, when the target is inside the receptive field, then the stimulus that the monkey chose, after the color change happens here, the neurons start responding a lot. So with this increase in response, half of the neurons did that. But when the distractor stimulus is inside the receptive field, the stimulus that the monkey was ignoring, this is exactly what you see, a decrease in response. 
And this response goes so low that it's almost filtering the stimulus completely. Now, the question for us is that this neuron doesn't see the distractor when the distractor is inside the receptive field. Does the monkey see the distractor? That's an important question because the monkey is conscious of the existence of a distractor. Of course it is. I mean, you can do that. Try to attend to two things that I put like that, and you still see this distracting thing. But this one, you attend to it. But those neurons, they don't. Basically, it was very interesting for us to see almost complete filtering. The other interesting thing that we saw was that it was like graded something, uh, uh, the intensity of this filtering of the distractor changed with the distance in the, in the, in the scale. So for distance, the, longer, the, the larger distance produced almost complete filtering. And the other distances uh, produced less and less filtering. We had three different distances in the ordinal scale. So that was an interesting thing because that stressed out the role of inhibition in, uh, uh, um, in, um, on attention. When we look at, we did some ROC analysis, which is a signal detection analysis, and we actually uh, uh, quantified the latency with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the latency uh, of the neuronal selection. So in this case, neuron seems to select uh, the target faster uh, for distance three. This is also like a measure of reaction time for humans. And you can see that distance three, they were quick, the neurons were very quick, then distance one were really bad because it was just close by. And when you look at the accuracy, it goes in the other way. Now, what was the behavior of the animal? The behavior of the animal was also the same. These are the two animals, um, Raul and Sergio. And, and actually what they did was exactly the same as what the neurons did. So the animals are good at filtering out the stimulus following the same trend as the neurons. Well, we can't explain 100% of the behavior by, doing, uh, by looking at single neurons, probably not. Although some neurons they did pretty well, but probably not. We have to find other models. Now, um, is, 40 minutes, um, is 40 minutes on total and then questions or other questions? Yeah, I'd love to speak. Oh, to speak. So uh, this was the work of uh, Teresa Lenner that was in the lab, a fantastic student. I think that um, uh, she, unfortunately she's going to leave the lab and, and, and do a postdoc now. Uh, I say unfortunately, I should be happy students going and do postdoc. Uh, anyway. So the activity of neurons in the solid prefrontal cortex correlates with the intensity of distraction suppression and assessed behaviorally. Many of the solid prefrontal neurons fully suppress the response to the distractor, but there is behavioral evidence that the animals still consciously perceive the distractor. I don't know how good the behavioral evidence is, but the behavioral evidence is me in front of the monitor and trying to filter it out. And also an experiment that I'm going to show you that we did in, a, in, a, in humans, an MEG experiment. So even if the person consciously perceived the distractor, the neurons filter them out. That doesn't look like an NCC, right? So this is an ordinary categorization task, something really interesting. When two different sets of two stimuli result, resulted in the same ordinal distance, the modulation of firing rates was the same. So for example, suppose, and I'm going to go back to the scale here. Suppose that what I was looking at was distance one. This is distance one between this one is uh, magenta and green, but between green and blue is also distance one. The neurons reacted exactly the same. So the neuron didn't distinguish color combinations. And I'm going to have a hard time if you tell me that the monkey didn't know that one was magenta and the other green and the one was blue and the other green. Because humans, they did. And we did the experiment in humans. So these neurons are filtering the stimuli, are doing some kind of job in the brain, in prefrontal cortex. But definitely, these neurons don't perceive. They don't know what's going on in terms of, of visual perception of the actual features of the stimulus. So there is something weird with that that doesn't make what we record in an NCC because definitely the neurons should have signal those features. Now we went a little bit farther and then we recorded from area MT and the solaria prefrontal cortex because we wanted to know uh, how visual neurons are reacting when the solaria prefrontal neurons are doing the job that we saw. So we recorded in one animal and we have a, a little bit of a different task. This is the same task that I told you that we call target distractor task. So there is uh, uh, the RDPs, the change in color, then a change in the target, and then the animal responds and he gets the tequila. So here, uh, the juice, 
the, uh, the fixation task in which the animal just detects a change in the luminance of the fixation point. So the similar were totally irrelevant. It was a hard, kind of hard change in the luminance of the fixation point, and the monkey gets really good at this, and then he gets a drop of juice. But it's not rewarded for attending to the stimulus. In fact, the monkey was supposed to ignore the stimuli. And this is over many and many trials. Now, we look at the responses of neurons in area MT and in a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and we found, I don't want to go into this, but we found two types of cells in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. One type of cells that we call it contra cells because have resected fields contralateral to the target, and the other type, ipsy cells, because have resected fields ipsilateral to the target. Um, this may change the definition, but it's mainly these cells, for example, selected the target very early during the target distractor task. That is what you see here in the top row. Ignore that for now. And, uh, and with this peak in response. But when you look at the ipsy cells, D cells and empty cells selected the target really late, much later. So when, when contra cells knew what, which one was the target and which one was the distractor, the ipsy cells and the empty neurons didn't know. So it was too early. So MT doesn't know which one is the target and the distractor. There is a decision that the monkey made there that probably the monkey is conscious of that decision, but uh, MT is, hasn't been uh, um, uh, alerted or told yet. Um, so the modulation starts very late. I have the quantitative data for this. I'm not going to show it. But more interesting than this, probably for this, info, for this uh, conference, is that... Um, MT, when, during the fixation task, MT didn't react at all. When the similar were irrelevant, MT didn't care at all. The ipsy cells in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex didn't care at all, but the contra cells selected the target. And we told the animals, don't do it. I mean, presumably the animal was in some kind of automatic mode, and it was just selecting the target. We don't have an explanation because we don't speak monkey language. We can't ask them uh, what they did or whether they were aware of which one was the target or not. I bet you, though, that if we do something like a, 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 a two alternative four choice task, probably the animal is going to select the target more often than the distractor if we do it after the trial. So which means is that probably something in the brain is telling the animal, okay, that one is the target, even if it wasn't paying attention and it wasn't aware of, of, of that specific thing. We quantified that doing like a signal detection analysis. And basically, signal detection analysis told us that um, what we have is, uh, uh, basically what you see here is the performance of contra ipsy and empty cells. And what you see is that the contra cell selects very, very early. So these are significant in, a, in, in an a rock, which is a measurement of how good the cells detected the stimulus. But the, the ipsy and the empty cells, they selected very late the target from the distractor. And, um, Again, if we look at the performance during the fixation task, only the contra cells did so. So if we ask the monkey where was the target, that's the question that we need to ask. We didn't ask it because that wasn't my, my objective, but going over all the literature on, on, on consciousness, on conscious per visual perception, I realized that this is an important thing. So um, the question is, uh, well, this is just a conclusion and ignores the distractor. The contralateral selected the target earlier and automatically, automatically. Did. The question is, is this what they call like zombie kind of neurons? Because the neurons know what's going on, but the animal is not consciously perceiving what's going on. I mean, it's a possibility. I don't know. Uh, and this is what they say in, in, the, in several articles that I read, that in a zombie mode, the main flow of information is probably feed forward. And when you engage the feet uh, back and you engage the whole network, that is uh, um, uh, when you get uh, conscious perception. Uh, it's possible. I don't know how much feedback those neurons are. We, we are working on that, and I think that we're going to have probably some answers. So we did an MEG experiment. I don't want to go into the details of the MEG experiment, but basically during, uh, what we did was to train subjects, human subjects, in a rule number one, which is select uh, it's, it's like green higher than blue, blue higher than red, and rule number two, we completely reverse the rule. Uh, we did this experiment with Pierre Jolicoeur at the University of Montreal. And actually, what we found is that we found very little filtering in, in early visual cortex. However, the filtering was following the rule also. Uh, we found that when we went to somewhere else, parietal cortex, we saw this strong 
filtering that looks like what we saw in prefrontal cortex in the monkey. Now the question is, it is something that we can generalize to species, what we do in the monkey or what we do in the mouse or what we do in the fly. It's really the NCCs are going to be the same in all the species. It's a complicated thing because I could have a hypothesis and say, listen, what the prefrontal cortex is doing in the monkey, the parietal cortex is doing in the human. Because if really through evolution you push that function back, I mean, you have more things uh, to be concerned of in the prefrontal cortex. Like, for example, I mean, math, uh, philosophy, science, the binding problem, things like that. So um, that is possible. So I don't know what the answer is. But the good thing is, like, for example, to use like the approach of Wolfsinger or other people, that like, they use multiple methods or try to collaborate with multiple people and see what we get. I'm going to talk a little bit about working memory. I have five minutes, five minutes to talk about working memory. Um, uh, so working memory is that, as physiologists, we like to think about the delay activity showing selectivity for location features of objects. Of course, you can find a lot of definitions of working memory. As a physiologist, I say working memory delay activity. So which means is that neurons somewhere in the brain are encoding what you have in working memory so uh, through the delay activity when the stimulus is not present. So that's what physiologists, we think that the neural correlates of working memory are. Now, the relationship with consciousness. Probably we are conscious of the context of working memory, but working memory is not needed for conscious perception. So I think that this is a hard one, too, because you have to ask a person. The best assessment for conscious perception is to ask a person whether they perceive it or not. So um, probably this thing has to go somewhere into working memory. If you know, you have to find some other measurement of that. What about if you consciously perceive it? It didn't go into working memory or into whatever generates your response or your report, and you still, you know, uh, consciously perceive it. So it's a very hard. I find it a very hard problem uh, to to approach uh, because it's about timing. Um, basically, what we did. The question that we asked was very simple. If the representation of non-spatial visual features was encoded in the firing rates of neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and in visual cortex. So we did a comparison of how is working memory. Uh, working memory was described uh, um, by Foster, Fuster in, Fuster, Joaquin Fuster in 1971. And this is what they call a spatial working memory. They found it in prefrontal neurons, where if you ask the animal to remember one of those locations, uh, uh, a certain neuron are, is going to fire only when the animal is remember one location and not the others. So this is what is called a spatial working memory, and this is a neural correlate. And it's, do it's done when the animal is not, uh, um, uh, is when there is no stimulus present. So uh, what we did was to record from the solaria prefrontal cortex and area MT. So here is uh, uh, the, the, the recording size. I'm going try to go quick through. This is MT and this is uh, dorsal area prefrontal cortex. MT is a visual area after V1. V1 projects to MT. The solaria prefrontal cortex is one of the things that we call prefrontal cortex that does everything. Uh, and we record it from, uh, from the animals with the, with the task where we teach that we instructed the animal to keep a direction of motion and working memory out of four different ones. And then we look at whether the neurons in MT would encode during the delay period of the task, it's a match to sample task, so remember the direction, keep it in memory, then match it to something else. This is the important thing to know is that there were four directions. And what we see in MT is that when the stimulus is present, when the stimulus is out there, you do have a very nice tuned response. But when the animal is remembering, and we know that the animal is remembered because we have some behavioral assessments of that, MT is silent. When you go to dorsal area prefrontal cortex, you find the opposite. During the delay period of the task, so there is selectivity uh, for visual features. It's not surprising that working memory is in, in frontal cortex. What is surprising is that the selectivity for such essential features like motion direction is still there. Now, basically, what uh, we concluded about this is that during, dur during a stimulation, when there is visual input, both areas seem to be activated. MT is a little bit more posterior than here. So there's a lot of prefrontal cortex and MT. Both are activated. Those have representations. During working memory only, uh, prefrontal cortex is activated. So uh, uh, the middle temporal area is not activated. We're talking about the classical working memory. We're not talking about iconic memory or something like that, or memory that could last for a, a very short period of time. And I think that we solve some kind of controversy that have been around the role of these areas. One interesting thing is that people in fMRI, they find that these visual areas encode memory or 
using ball signal activation. We don't find it. So, and we have been doing several controls and we don't find it. So I'm going to try to summarize things in this slide. So the visual neurons do not completely filter out distractor stimuli. So the question is, does the intensity of filtering correlate with conscious perception of this stimuli? So they do not filter out. When the monkey sees the things, the, the stimulus is there. Uh, the, the visual neurons are responding. The visual neurons do not select the target stimulus automatically, like in a zombie mode, so they don't do that, at least in our experiment. But visual neurons do not encode working memory signals. Do they encode iconic memories? I don't know. But they do not encode working memory signals. It would be nice if they do, because then we can have a nice NCC. And now, in prefrontal cortex, many neurons filter completely the attended stimulus when the animal perceive, still perceive it. That's bad for NCCs. Prefrontal neurons encode visual features and object categories. And prefrontal neurons and co-working memory for features. So those are two good things. Now, my reasoning here is if you put them the two together, probably, uh, you're going to come up to the hypothesis that uh, Wolfsinger was talking about, whether it is one area or it is several areas in the brain. Probably you will get that this working memory is going to go away, so because this one makes up for that one, and then you have the NCCs probably in a nice way. So I think that is more like a property of the network. Now, how can we explore the activity of networks? The, the last thing that we are doing is um, uh, using uh, these uh, microelectrodes arrays, and with microelectrodes array, we can explore um, um, the activities. Uh, let me just go quick through this. We can record from many neurons at the time. That's what we are doing in the lab. And we can do these kind of uh, maps within an area and between areas where we can look at correlation between neurons, and we can look uh, at that kind of uh, 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 things more in detail, so we probably would be able to explore the whole network and interactions within the network. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll stop here.